welcome and happy Father's Day to those of you who are here and to those of you who are worshiping with us online. Happy Father's Day and welcome to worship. I have a few announcements. First, I want to say thank you so much to all who volunteered for an amazing, awesome VBS. It was wonderful. So, yes, thank you so much. We had, I believe, 11 kiddos, right, give their hearts to the Lord. So, praise the Lord. So, thank you so much. And for those who fed our volunteers, we thank you for that as well. It was wonderful. of the Lord. We lift up our hands in the sanctuary and praise the Lord. May the Lord, the maker of heaven and earth, bless us as we worship him. Please remain standing for our hymn of praise, the church's one foundation.
You may be seated. It's time in our service where we gather together for a congregational prayer. If you are able and you would like, we would love to have you join us here at the altar to give our prayers to the Lord. O sovereign Lord, you are the creator, father of all humanity. You have made us and support us every day, yet you are a special father to those who know, love, and honor you. Thank you, blessed father, for adopting us as your own. You have called us in Christ to come to you and to find your yoke easy and your burden light. Your work for us is honorable, and your commandments we find glorious and life-giving. We know your goodness toward us is so undeserved. We confess your mercy has too little affected our living. We have imperfectly improved in the privileges you have given of prayer and fasting, of sacraments and scripture, of service and worship. Have mercy on us, Father, for our every trespass and bring us to true repentance. Help us hate what is false, be attentive to our own condition and the needs of those around us. Guard our tongues from evil and keep our hearts with all diligence that we may love you well all our days. Help us watch and pray against temptation and to be concerned for the salvation of others. Our hearts ache for those who are bound for destruction in this life and in eternity to come. We pray for all those who are united to us in ties of family and friendship. Be merciful to them, Lord, and awaken them to life in Jesus. May they be precious in your sight and become fully devoted to your glory alone. Sanctify your people, O God. Prosper the work of our hands. Give us true devotion to you through wise instruction personal discipline, and living examples of faithfulness, all in the power of your Holy Spirit. As you love us with the love of a perfect Father, may we love the people of this world with compassionate, convicting, and correcting love that leads many home to you and to our Father's house. We pray in Jesus' name as he taught us to pray. Our Father, who art in heaven, hallowed be thy name. Thy kingdom come, thy will be done, on earth as it is in heaven. Give us this day our daily bread, and forgive us our trespasses, as we forgive those who trespass against us. And lead us not into temptation, but deliver us from evil. For thine is the kingdom and the power and the glory forever. Amen.
Please stand for our hymn of preparation, Trust and Obey. Thank you for continuing to stand uh, for the reading of our scripture. <clears throat> the scripture comes from Luke. Uh, Luke was a physician. Uh, he was um, a person who wrote, of course, both the books Luke and Acts. Uh, he was a very, very gifted writer. Uh, it was Paul the Apostle, you know Paul the Apostle, who wrote um, many, many, matter of fact, two-thirds of the New Testament in his letters. Uh, Luke took the testimony of Paul and put it down uh, as the uh, gospel. And, you know, there's Matthew, Mark, Luke, and John, the four gospels. But Luke is the only one who has, you can have a seat, go ahead and have a seat. I'm, I'm don't, going on too long here. Uh, <laughs> Luke uh, is the only one who records this story. Uh, as you know, there is the birth of Jesus, you know, um, and of course we celebrate that during Advent and Christmas time when Jesus is born. And we don't hear in any of the other Gospels 
uh, about Jesus until we get to um, the time of his ministry. Actually, when he goes into uh, the wilderness, becomes tempted. But before that, that time, we have very little information about him but this story in Luke. We have him at about 12 years old. You know, that's that odd time of life, you know, between infancy and, and uh, we had several of these, these kids in vacation Bible school, you know, and they get ornery. And uh, this is kind of an ornery Jesus here, if you'll listen to the story. In Scripture, uh, this is Luke 2, verses 41 through 52. Have the slide. Every year, Jesus' parents went to Jerusalem for the festival of the Passover. When he was 12 years old, they went up to the festival according to the custom. After the festival was over, while his parents were returning home, the boy Jesus stayed behind in Jerusalem. But they were unaware of it. Thinking he was in their company, they traveled on for a day. Then they began looking for him among their relatives and friends. When they did not find him, they went back to Jerusalem. Imagine how worried they were to look for him. After three days, they found him in the temple courts, sitting amongst the teachers, listening to them and asking them questions. Everyone heard him was amazed at his understanding and his answers. When his parents saw him, they were astonished. His mother said to him, son, why have you treated us like this? Your father and I have been anxiously searching for you. Why were you searching for me? He asked. Didn't you know I had to be in my father's house? Another translation says, or be about my father's business. But they did not understand what he was saying to them. Then he went down to Jerusalem with them and was obedient to them. But his mother treasured all these things in her heart. And Jesus grew in wisdom and stature and in favor with God and man. Now, this is Father's Day, and this is not, again, part of my sermon, but I just have to mention this. I heard in the coffee room, in the reception room, one person was talking to me about Father's Day. And by the way, you might notice that my sermon title is Our Father's Day having to do with God, our Father's Day, but was mentioning that in some churches you don't hear about fathers, you know, on Father's Day or mothers on Mother's Day, and uh, because we don't want to exclude anyone who could be standing in their stead, right? Um, just want to mention to you, you know, in, from seminary training, father is the appropriate word to use for our father, God for several reasons. It's not about gender. We, in human capacity for communication, uh, hermeneutics is what we use to study words, to study language. And when we talk about God being a rock or, um, you know, the, 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 we, might be, we might be the salt of the earth, but uh, there is only metaphor only metaphor that we human beings have to be able to talk about things. And when we talk about God, the closest thing we can say is Father, because it stands for begotten, from. Jesus is from God, okay? Begotten of, not made, not created from God. And the word that we have for that, the most appropriate word for that, is Father. He had a mother, an earthly mother. That was Mary. God was the Father. It was from him. He was begotten. Jesus was begotten. Not made. Not a creature of the earth. Fully God, fully man. So, and Jesus also referred to him as Father. In many prayers. Our Father, Jesus says, right? When he prays to him in the garden, he says, Abba, Father. 
That's daddy, okay, when he talks to God. When he prays to him, he calls him father. So it is appropriate for us to use the word father. Now the last thing I want to say is uh, about Vacation Bible School. Uh, I had a great time there, had games. I was a helper. Uh, Carol Reed was the leader, and I was there to help. But the kids got to know me as, uh, as uh, liking jokes. And one of the 10-year-olds came up to me one time, and, uh, one, one evening, three days into this, and said, I have a joke for you. And I said, what is your joke? And he said, um, what do you call a father walking up the stairs? And I said, I don't know. And he said, stepdaddy. All right. I said, that is a terrific joke. You know, that is a terrific joke. When we uplift fathers on Father's Day, we are uplifting all that take care of children. You know, all the mentors. There were mentors in Vacation Bible School. There are some fathers we know in society that are not good fathers, and sometimes that is difficult for people to come to our Father God because of the father, the only father that they know is not a good one. So when we uplift fathers on Father's Day, God had a plan, you know, that we have fathers and mothers to take care of children, but when that fails, because this is a broken world, we do the best we can with our mentors, etc. So we celebrate all on Father's Day. This is Father's Day. We celebrate the good attributes of good fathers. <clears throat> An illustration of this is when I had a patient, I'm a dentist, who have, uh, I've known since he was our son, Tony, our middle son. Tony's a, a pastor. Uh, but he was Tony's friend in, uh, from kindergarten, uh, all the way through high school. Now a dad himself, this uh, fellow. He told this story to me, this young father did, in the office just a couple of weeks ago. This young father recounted that the evening before, his young son was showering and, sham and shampoo got in his eyes. This dad helped his crying son by getting the soap out and then consoling him. Later that evening, their son was being hugged by his mother. During the embrace, the mom said, Wow! Your hair smells great. This dad went on to say that his son looked up at his mom and said, you should smell my eyes. <laughs> I cracked up, and of course he did too. <clears throat> I thought about this young father, who was also a great dad. I'd known him when he was a young Cub Scout in Julie in my den going to high school, becoming a firefighter here in this community, and now as a young father. He was there when his son got soap in his eyes and was crying, just like his wife would do, of course. This dad, who was at the time monitoring his son in the shower, was there to help his son in distress. He was there to get soap out of his eyes, to comfort him, let him know that he was going to be okay. And I know he will be there for every other trial, great and small, throughout his young son's life and continue to be there throughout his entire life. A good dad, a good father. Could I have the next slide? Jesus says, which of you fathers, if your son asks for a fish, will give him a snake instead. By the way, he was talking to the disciples. Or if he asks for an egg, will give him a scorpion. If you then, though you are evil, know how to give good gifts to your children, how much more will your Father in heaven give the Holy Spirit to those who ask him? That is Luke 11, verses 11 through 13. Have the next slide. In Luke 11, one thing that really popped out at me as I was reading that, because this is about fathers, in Luke 11, 13, uh, verse 13, it says, If you then, though you are evil, know how to give good gifts to your children, if the gospel writers had been 
editors and public relations personnel, they may have just edited out those words, though you are evil. So that the verse would read this, if you then know how to give good gifts to your children, how much more will your Father in heaven give the Holy Spirit to those who ask him? This, though you are evil phrase, is easy to ignore, just to gloss over it. I have to be honest, a lot of times I'll read in scripture and I'll see something tough, tough in my life to try to do, and I'll just kind of gloss over that to get to the, the next part. I've heard some very prominent pastors question Jesus saying tough things. One pastor had an excuse for every uncomfortable passage that Jesus utters. This pastor liked to say, I don't, Jesus, I don't think Jesus meant that literally. And this pastor went so far as to say, the Jesus I know would never say, fill in the blank. What I love about the Bible is that it is honest and it is truthful. The gospel writers didn't have Jesus ride into Jerusalem on what we refer to as Palm Sunday, which is Passover, a white stallion. The gospel writers wrote that he rode on, on a donkey, a very humble animal. The gospel writers were careful to add that Peter, whom Jesus called the rock on whom I established this church, but he also told Peter once, get behind me, Satan. The 12 disciples, after Jesus was crucified, ran and hid. This is an honest accounting of what the gospel writers have put down. Rather than just saying they stood firm in, in every belief about Jesus, even up to the cross, no. The gospel writers wrote what happened. They ran and hid. Yet after the resurrection, these scared average guys became unwavering apostolic leaders until most of them were cruelly killed themselves, never wavering, all of them, till their death. But this is about our personal relationship with God, Father, Son, and Holy Spirit, and ourselves. Jesus wants us to live freely. He wants us to have the best life. The more we are like him, we can never be entirely like him. He is divine, the son of God. But the more we are like him by turning from evil, which is in our life, life is freer. Evil is binding. It drags us down. Paul says, for I do not do the good I want to do. But the evil I do not want to do, I keep doing. Romans 7, 19. He goes on to say, So I find this law at work. Although I want to do good, evil is right there with me. That's Romans 7, 21. That begs the question, so what's the big deal? Jesus recognizes that we're evil. He said, though you are evil. Paul knows that he, we, are evil. And it's almost part and parcel of our lives. Let's just accept it. And move on. Do the best we can. Ask for forgiveness for sins before we partake in communion with our Lord. And we're good. Right? There in those in the church that believe that that is the right approach. And moving further in this vein, not only to accept the evil sin, but to embrace it as part of our lives to the point that we not only accept it, but we affirm that life in sin as okay way to live. 
It's our life after all. But is it really? Many people in this congregation know that I am a recovering alcoholic. Seven years, three months, and 11 days sober. I never had a DUI. I was never arrested. I never took this into the office. And this disease was not a real issue until after our children were raised. Praise the Lord. But it was always, as the Apostle Paul says, was right there with me. When I was into my free time, it finally consumed it. When asked if I would consider quitting, and you can imagine who the constant voice in my head was that would ask that question because she was closest to it. When asked to quit, I would say, when I think it's a problem, I'll quit. This is my life. You have yours. The most frightening moment for an alcoholic is when you know you have a problem, and yet you cannot quit. That is terrifying. We who like to consider ourselves strong, self-reliant, self-determined, and capable of handling all of life's difficult problems on our own by sheer self-will, will find it petrifyingly frightening to know it is impossible to stop something you are now determined must end. It is ruining life itself. Evil is winning in your life. Drinking is not a sin, but drunkenness is. There is plenty in the Bible that is said about that in both the Old Testament and the New Testament. You can't get away from it when you look at it biblically. Drunkenness is taking the level of drinking to idolatry, pushing God aside and everything else for the main thing in your life. It is always bad. My bottom. My bottom. I asked my daughter if I could talk about this. She said, Dad, it's your story. My bottom occurred after a weekend with my daughter and son-in-law and two young grandsons visited. And on Monday evening, I was sober. Of course, at that moment, I called her to ask how she was doing. She said, Dad, I'm not going to bring our boys around if you're going to continue to drink. And I fell off the planet. I told my wife what Debbie said, and she said two words. Oh, no. How many years had I been trying to quit? Going through white-knuckling maybe as long as six months. Never worked. What does this have to do with fatherhood? Really, everything. Sin in Greek is amartia. As in archery, it's missing the mark, aiming, if you will, in the wrong direction. And sin is not from God. There are those who love to say, heck, I've heard this in, in AA rooms, heck, I thought of regarding of my sin, God made me this way, i.e. with this sinful nature. And the next slide. God is not the author of sin. In James 1.13 it states, 
let no one say when he is tempted, I am being tempted by God. God cannot be tempted with evil, and he himself tempts no one. Slide number 10. And sin does not originate in God's nature or being. In 1 John 1 5, it said, God is light, and in him is no darkness at all. So, if God is not the author of sin, nor the origin of sin, and yet, like the Apostle Paul, who said, but the evil I do, I do not want to do, this I keep on doing. As a father of a daughter who says, Dad, if you're going to be this way, I'm not going to bring those boys, your grandsons, around. How does someone become of free from sin when it's inescapable? There is one only powerful enough to defeat sin, and that is God. Father, Son, and Holy Spirit, period. There is one adage that I've heard, and I believe this to be true. I cannot tell you what to do, but I can tell you what worked for me. Forever it would seem I would pray a prayer like this. <clears throat> Pardon me. God, take this obsession away from me. The very next day, the obsession was there, and my other big sin, pride, I would think, well, God had his chance. He didn't take it away. So I guess I can go back to my habit. Wow! Right? Yeah. Now, however, being faced flat on my back, I had fought and fought and now had lost the battle when you're down so low that the only way is up from that spot, I had only one prayer left. And that was this. <laughs> God, I don't know what to do anymore. Please, please tell me what I need to do. Then as I, as I like to say, I took the cotton out of my ears and I stuffed it in my mouth so I could hear. I got a very clear message to go to AA, Alcoholics Anonymous. I had heard about it. I knew nothing about it. Briefly, the 12 steps, you hear about the 12 steps, lead you to God and are replete with language about God. We end every meeting, by the way, with the Lord's Prayer. They don't talk about Christianity. They say our higher, higher power, whatever you call higher power. Anyone who stays around the table, sober, long term, always come around to God, don't they? Yes, always say, my higher power, which I choose to call God. But it is a, it's a Christian program. I, uh, pardon me for Alcoholics Anonymous members out there in the television audience, but it is. Uh, we're going to write a book about that someday. And, um, but we end with our, the Lord's Prayer. What, is, how, what does the Lord's Prayer start with? Our Father. It's a Christian program, really. So Our Father, that's the, uh, <clears throat> the title of the sermon. The 12 step leads you to God and replete with language about God. Having personally come to Jesus earlier in my life, in my 40s, this was no problem. Now I was about the business of doing the work and following the program toward sobriety. It is, as they say, a very simple program. Don't drink. Um, <laughs> but you have to do the work, right? Let's go back to what Jesus said. Slide 11. Yeah. Concerning fathers. He said about loving fathers, we're about done. Which of you fathers, if you asks for a fish, will give him a snake instead? 
or if he asks for an egg, we'll give him a scorpion. You then, though you are evil, know how to give good gifts to your children, how much more will your Father in heaven give the Holy Spirit to those who ask him? Brothers and sisters, fathers and mothers, daddies and mommies, sons and daughters, Jesus forgives every sin for those who earnestly repent. And he redeems us from the guilt of sin. And the Father, Son have sent the Holy Spirit who can guide us and strengthen us to overcome the power of sin. Now I have to say that again because sometimes people outside of our church often point to the church and say they're no better than us. I don't know why I go to church, they're just hypocrites. If there is no power to change, transform our hearts and minds towards something better, where does that come from? When you pray for forgiveness and ask Jesus Christ to be your savior, savior and mean it and not just say the words, the Holy Spirit, okay, you are forgiven. Before you take communion, we confess our sins. I don't care what church you're in, you confess your sin before you come to the table. You cannot come to this holy place without saying you ask, beg for forgiveness for your sins. Your sins are forgiven, so you are gotten rid of the guilt of sin so you can come to the table and have Jesus' body and his blood and take of that. But you can't do that without confession. You are relieved of the guilt of sin. But the Father and the Son send, it says, your Father in heaven will give you the Holy Spirit if you ask him to guide and strengthen you to overcome the power of sin. Guilt, power. With that power which only comes from God, we are freer from sin. We miss the mark less and less and we aim higher and higher. The mark is God, the Almighty, the Everlasting, our Counselor, our Redeemer, our Rock, our Salvation. And we are told because it is true that all who earnestly repent of their sins and say with their mouth, their heart, their soul, and mind that Jesus Christ is our Lord and Savior will have eternal life with him. Today, let's celebrate our fathers, but remembering the Father who is the author of creation itself, the one who is your sure foundation and my sure foundation. Let's make this our Father's Day. Amen. Amen. Well, the invitation to the offering comes from Psalm 96, 8. Ascribe to the Lord the glory due his name. Bring an offering and come into his courts. Oh 
one on earth as it is in heaven. Give us this day Forgive us our debts as we forgive our debtors. And lead us not into temptation, but deliver us from evil. For thine is the kingdom and the power and the glory forever. Thank you for your many blessings and bounties that you give us in life. We offer up to you but a portion of that, dear Lord, for the service to your kingdom. We thank you, Lord. In Jesus' name, amen. And we have a final hymn, correct? Yes. It's a final hymn. Before we sing our final hymn, which is on page 397, I Need Thee Every Hour, We've noticed that there are some guests that are in uh, the congregation today. Welcome uh, to you. We just wanted to mention to you, don't leave without stopping by. There is a, vis a, a visitor's center, a welcoming center, to give you some information and meet with uh, someone who is in our church. So please stop by there and welcome, welcome. It's great to have you. Let's sing our final uh, hymn, shall we?
go and be in the peace that only Jesus Christ can give you. Jesus will watch over you every step of your way. Jesus will walk beside you. Jesus is all around you. Just become aware of him. Ask him to come into your heart and help lead you in his will. And go spread the news, the good news, out there in the community and everywhere you go. Amen.